Great. Thank you uh, very much for your patience. We're delighted to welcome back uh, Ambassador Munir Akram um, in, uh, in many ways to this uh, press briefing room. Uh, Ambassador Akram, the permanent representative of Pakistan, is here in his capacity as president of the Economic and Social Council. So, Ambassador, please, you have the floor, and uh, then we'll take some questions. Thank you very much. Th uh, thank you uh, for having me. <clears throat> Uh, today, uh, I just want to f um, quickly say that for the Economic and Social Council this year is obviously uh, an extraordinarily important year because uh, of the COVID crisis and the impact that this has had uh, on the global economy. We're facing the worst recession in a century apart from a pandemic that is out of out of control. So the economic and social impacts on the global economy, and especially on the poorest countries, are obvious, and all the statistics are available, uh, and and the responses uh, that the international community has uh, has mobilized uh, are also quite evident. But what can the council do to help in this? And my uh, own view is that we could, uh, the Council could focus on at least three, ish, three issues uh, in order to help. First, how can we capture the proposals that on financing for, for development, on, on financing recovery, especially in the developing countries, that have emanated uh, from this process that the Secretary General, uh, Canada and Jamaica have initiated. And uh, there are a large number of proposals and options, so-called options for financing that have emerged. Uh, but we need to focus on five, six, seven of the most important of these proposals and see how we can, through the FFD process in ECOSOC, how we can capture agreement on at least some of the most important proposals. And the Secretary General, in his uh, last discussions, um, uh, informal discussions, has identified some of, some of these proposals, the, uh, sus the debt suspension initiative, uh, debt swaps, uh, the whole idea of SDR creation, uh, the liquidity and sustainability facility that's been proposed by the Economic Commission of Africa, uh, the illicit financing issue, fi uh, financing issue. These are some of the, some of the sort of issues that we we could try to capture in uh, a consensus in the FFT process. And this will be my effort. We will start consultations, uh, hopefully with the support of the Secretary General, support of the Deputy Secretary General, and other parts of the UN machinery. Uh, we will try to. Uh, crystallize agreement on at least some of some of the financing issues. I think the second issue uh, on which I've tried to focus is on infrastructure investment. Uh, infrastructure investment, uh, I think uh, it is basically the real path to the SDGs. 92% uh, of all sustainable development goals will be impacted by investment in infrastructure, energy, transportation, housing, sanitation, water, et cetera. These are going to impact the, the, re the real change that we can bring in SDG uh, achievement is going to be through infrastructure and infrastructure investment. The, uh, the estimation is that there is $1.5 trillion short on addition on uh, on infrastructure investment annually in in developing countries, and we have to find ways to do this. The the money is there in the market. There's trillions of dollars sitting in negative interest rates uh, in the market. The question is how to connect that money with a, with a pipeline of projects in the developing countries. And the reason we are not able to do so is because developing countries do not have the capacity to develop projects which are bankable, uh, are of, of, a, of a nature in terms of formulation, in terms of conception, that 
are bankable that, that you could go to somebody and get investment uh, from, from the market for, for these. So my idea is to create a facility associated with the United Nations, a public-private facility, where we would be able to utilize the UNRC system, the, UN, the UNDP's resident, resident uh, representative system, which is there in over 190 countries, to be able to help countries to develop feasible projects for investment and to use this facility to connect with the private, to, uh, with the private sector. This is very, in very simple terms what, what uh, I've conceived. And the third area where, where, I'd, li where I'd like to focus and we are exploring uh, with various parts of uh, the UN system is science and technology. On science and technology, firstly, targeted research. We've seen with the vaccine that once you have a targeted objective in science in R and D, you are apt to get the results faster than if you didn't have a target. So we need to find targets in the SDG matrix as to what are the breakthroughs that we're looking for in order to make a change in, in the SDGs. Secondly, we need to see how the IP regime, the intellectual property regime, can be aligned with SDGs because intellectual property, for example, medicines. Uh, there are already calls for a waiver of IP uh, constraints on certain medicine production for, for, for the COVID vaccine, for AIDS, and so on and so forth. These are just examples of what, in what ways we could facilitate SDG achievement by a more relaxed approach to the IP regime. And thirdly, of course, is the Secretary General's uh, own initiative for bridging the digital divide. I think it's a huge challenge. There are many moving parts in it. Uh, and if we can at least put it on the right path, uh, and if ECOSOC can help put it in the right path, that would be also a major contribution. So these are some of the pressure points where I, I, I'm trying to be see if ECOSOC can be helpful. Thank you. Uh, James Bayes, Al Jazeera, and then we'll go to Iftikhar. Ambassador, um, the last global recession, many people said the G20 played an important role of getting the world out of it. The G20 meets in just a few days' time uh, virtually, but uh, chaired by Saudi Arabia. What is your message to the G20 and what should they do? Well, I, I think from, you know, the, what we've seen in the last finance minister's meeting, uh, G20 has agreed to an extension of the DSSI, the debt suspension, but only up to June of next year. The, 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 some of the gaps that were in the DSSI have not been addressed. The, the whole issue of the middle-income countries, uh, which are in under stress, some of the SIDs, which are under stress, it's not been addressed. And some of the larger issues, which... Uh, have emerged from the Secretary General's own process, uh, which is SDR creation, uh, is, is a big issue. Big issue. Um, the whole issue of private sector participation in debt suspension, but not only in debt suspension, in, in trying to compress interest rates at which uh, money is available to developing countries. Uh, the OECD countries are able to borrow at 0.45%. The Egypt, for example, has borrowed at 13 percent, and some African countries at, at higher interest rates. You cannot actually repay a loan at that, that interest rate. It doubles every three years, uh, and, and it's a debt. that's the debt trap. Um, so we need to find um, solutions on these two or three. Debt suspension, which is comprehensive, also through debt suspension, debt swaps and, and debt write-offs and so forth for least developed countries. We need SDR creation. Uh, we need the uh, liquidity and sustainability facility and private sector participation. And we need something if we can get done on the multilateral development banks, if they can enhance their, their, their concessional flows. Uh, either through IDA and through other means, but they need to expand uh, the concessional flows. They, 
They have got the capitalization. They can be recapitalized. There is the capacity, uh, but it just has to be geared to be to flow to those countries which need the financing. And we haven't got we haven't got that comprehensive approach. If the G20 can get together agreement on these five or six proposals, I think they would really make a difference to to what's happening in the world. Thank you, Mr. Ali. <coughs> Uh, thank you, Steph. Uh, Ambassador, you referred to the uh, Secretary General's initiative for financing for development, uh, which is uh, in collaboration with Prime Ministers of Canada and uh, Jamaica. Uh, it has been many months, and there is also uh, pr pr Prime Minister Imran Khan's uh, initiative for uh, debt relief. Now, this has uh, been, there have been several months, uh, these, these have been de debated. What has been the reaction from the uh, countries who are in position to provide this relief? Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> I think uh, I partially covered uh, that in the uh, earlier, earlier response. But the Prime Minister, Prime Minister Imran Khan made this appeal in early April. It was very, very early in, in, in this crisis, and, and I think uh, he realized that this would have a major impact on developing countries like Pakistan and other uh, others who have a, a debt situation. Um, <clears throat> we convened a group here uh, uh, of interested countries to consider the debt issue. And I think one of the early responses was, that, was the G20's DSSI, uh, the, the G20's Debt Suspension Initiative. Uh, I think it was in May. Uh, that that the DSSI was announced, and that was a major uh, development in, for for those 44, 45 countries who benefited. And in fact, Pakistan was one of the major beneficiaries of of the debt suspension initiative of the of the G20. But obviously, that's not enough. Uh, we, as uh, has been mentioned, we need to the crisis, the requirements of developing countries now are estimated at one point. 2.5 trillion, this is an untad estimate, uh, and the IMF estimate of 2.5 trillion, they're nowhere close to getting that much money. So we, we have to make uh, major, major efforts uh, to see how, how to raise that, that amount of fiscal uh, space for the developing countries. Thank you. Uh, Toby Burns, NHK, Japanese TV. Thank you very much, uh, and thank you, Ambassador, for, uh, for speaking to us today. Um, you, you mentioned uh, aligning the international intellectual property regime with the SDGs. Do you see an impasse here? Uh, are, are these incompatible frameworks, or, or can, they, can they link up in a productive way? Yes, it's a, it's a, it's a difficult, um, mind you, it's a difficult ask, um, because uh, the intellectual property in the patent regime is obviously designed to protect the the investment of those who develop certain products. But there are certain products which are important enough for the global good, you know, for global common good, that it would be it would be a, a advisable to see how to compensate the IP holders in order to make that product available for the global good. And I think uh, the AIDS, uh, the exception which was made in the WTO back in the 1990s is one example of how that helped develop the cheaper AIDS uh, treatment uh, production in India and Brazil and other other countries which were able to provide that medicine in Africa and, and other places that's just one sort of example from history but there are other other areas now where you know for COVID for for uh, desertification for water stress these are these are clearly issues on which if we have the technologies we've got to find ways to apply them uh, and apply them on, on a global basis so that, that's the whole idea and it's a, it's a difficult issue no doubt but at least we should have a 
we should have a discussion on, on where, wh wh what technologies are relevant. Thank you. Uh, Iftisam Azam, Iftisam, Al Arabi newspaper, go ahead. Go uh, thank you, thank you, Stefan. Thank you, Ambassador. Um, so my question is, uh, going back to you, the issue you talked about, the infrastructure and investment and uh, money negative, could you elaborate on that and how realistic is it to, to get the money actually uh, needed there? Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think <clears throat> there are actually already a number of platforms which try to source projects in developing countries and try to link it up with the private sector, private sector investment as such. But there is, but most of the projects which are being the so-called uh, ESG part, projects or impact investing, uh, these are um, a very narrow window uh, at, at the present moment because impact investing, you know, still it's an unclear, unclear formulation. My idea is to link any project that is contributing to sustainable development as a qualified project for investment from, from the private sector. So the mechanism it would work would be as follows. You source... The, the project is sourced, for example, by UNDP or the resident coordinator's office in country X, developing country. They identify there are these three or four sustainable development relevant projects that they have planned to do. That country doesn't have the capacity or the money to actually finance a feasibility study because the preparation of, pre, of a pre-feasibility study and a feasibility study for a large infrastructure project can run into millions of dollars. And many countries just defer those projects and, and do projects for which grant money is available from donor countries, and they just do those small projects. UNDP has 20 projects in a, in a country. Each one is 2 million, 3 million. What I'm suggesting is that once you identify those projects in a developing country, the ODA providers who, who give money to UNDP, who give money to the World Bank, who give money to other, other institutions, that the ODA providers finance that pre-feasibility study and the feasibility study, which the developing country is not able to do, build the capacity in that developing country to actually prepare the feasibility reports, finance those feasibility studies, and then use a mechanism which, is, which is, con consists of both the public and private sector to bring those projects in front of the investors. Uh, and those investors are sitting here, they're sitting in Abu Dhabi, they're sitting uh, in various places. These are both public and private investors. There's a lot of money that is available, but that money will only go to a project that is considered feasible and bankable. And developing countries, because of capacity and because of money, do not have the ability to formulate those bankable projects in only emerging markets or advanced developing countries like Brazil or India and, and others. They can formulate those projects because they have the capacity and they have the money. But the smaller developing countries do not have the capacity, do not have the money. And that's, that's where I'm saying that the ODA and the UN's mechanism, the OD, and the UN's RC system can be utilized to help them get projects which are which are fundable, which are investable. Great. Uh, Ambassador, thank you very much. We hope to see you back here uh, during your term as president often. Thank you. And we wish you all thank you very much, and all have a good day.